Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's conference call to discuss Nano Dimensions third quarter 2022 financial results and quarterly updates. My name is Betsy, and I'll be your operator for today's event. On the call with us today are Yoav Stern, Chairman and CEO, Yael Sandler, CFO, and Julian Letterman, Head of Corporate Development. Before we begin, may I remind our listeners that certain information provided on this call may contain forward-looking statements. And the safe harbor statement outlined in today's earnings press release also pertains to this call. If you have not received a copy of the press release, please view it in the Investor Relations section of the company's website. Yoav will begin the call with a business update, followed by a question and answer session, at which time Yael will answer questions. I would now like to turn the conference over to Nano Dimensions Chairman and CEO, Yoav Stern. Yoav, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good day to everybody. Uh, we're going to go, which is short. Hopefully everybody has it in front of him. Um, we finished a beautiful quarter of $10 million of revenue, which takes us to about $31 million of revenue over three quarters, comparing to three quarters last year is hundreds and hundreds of percent above, up to almost a thousand. Uh, and comparing uh, to the last quarter, a uh, similar period last year, it's also 650%. So uh, we're happy about it, and uh, we have certain criticism at ourselves, which we'll be talking about, but we'll start with the highlights. We'll go through what we think should be improved. So on the highlights, uh, which are not numbers highlights, but rather uh, milestones in the business, first and foremost, uh, we had M&A and investment activity. We acquired a relatively small company, but probably with the largest potential to grow from all the acquisitions we acquired until now. It's called Admatec Formatec in Netherlands with an amazing additive manufacturing uh, technology for metals and Ceramics based on DLP, direct or digital light processing. Uh, it is something we looked for for a long time. Size of the company was relatively small, less than $10 million in revenue, but it was a subsidiary for many, many years of a much larger company that was in different business. So uh, it was growing kind of behind the scenes, and uh, we believe that the growth potential is more than anything we acquired until now, and it would be already manifested as we go forward, this year they'll finish one and a half quarter under us, which are already ahead of their projections last year. Uh, on the Fabrica side, um, the first AM company we acquired a year and a half ago, major advancement in the material. And if people remember, I, mem I told you early in the game that uh, whoever speaks about additive manufacturing uh, in general, and additive manufacturing electronics specific as a technology of robotics automation, is missing the point. Additive manufacturing main core technology is materials, materials, process, and process. And a major advancement here in Fabrica, which will uh, was the main uh, kind of uh, blocking uh, of um, substantial sales, because it took us until now since we acquired them to develop the new materials. So that's very good. AME application development. I should say what's not written here, we have a, a very, very uh, exciting advancement in the materials and AME as well, uh, which enabled the application development. We have about three, three new materials that are much better than the previous materials that are going to be released to the market at the beginning of the quarter, uh, next quarter, and they are going to be applied for all the models of the machines we have, including backwards compatibility which is very, very important. Uh, customers are very excited. Uh, we had just a month ago um, um, customers' uh, users' conference in Munich. We had 40 people, uh, 24 customers, and including very high-profile ones, which I can't mention for obvious reasons, and excitement was, was felt across the board. And fi finally, last but not least, uh, in spite of the amount of cash we have, we are still operating the way we operated last year in so much as the acquisitions. We're frugal. We're not spending money on acquisitions which are foolish 
at multiples that are totally unacceptable, which was done by everybody around us. And we relate the same way to management of our overhead, which is not acquisitions. Of our manpower this quarter, in the beginning of the third quarter. That was not easy in a company that is growing and where the employees and executives know that we are relatively comfortable cash-wise. I still, and we still, yeah, and myself insisted on reducing the headcount because we felt when company grows so fast, there's enough fat that we can cut, and it resulted in reduction of $10 million expenses level on this quarter comparing to uh, the original budget, which we're very proud of. Um, now, back, now back to focusing on the numbers, which are important. So the revenue is $10 million this quarter, $31.5 million for the three quarters. Gross margin is deceiving because obviously the IFRS includes a lot of uh, non-cash expenses and for share shares, um, granting, etc. But look at the 29. Even the 29, which is net and its real gross margin, is a bit lower. Uh, our typical gross margin is about 40, and it's a combination of margins of above 60 for the new machines and about 40, 38 for the more machines that are in a later stage in their life cycle as products. So why is it lower uh, this quarter? The answers are pretty clear, and I'll speak about it in the next slide. Our uh, EBITDA uh, of nine, minus $24 million includes about $13.5 million of investment in R&D. That basically means that if you guys told me that if we didn't have the belief in the huge multi-hundred million dollars potential of the additive manufacturing electronics, which demands still an investment of about 13 million dollars a quarter in R&D, we could close, cut that, or sell that, and within two, three quarters, we'll be making money. We're not going to do that, because we're not going to give up the opportunity which we believe will lead us to uh, where we promised it will lead us. So it is still important to know that as we look at the EBITDA, uh, half of it, uh, more than half of it is an investment in R&D, and the rest, by the way, was investment in uh, developing the go-to-market after the acquisitions. The net cash used in operation is $22.3 million, which is more than $10 million less than projected. Our projected uh, run rate for the whole year was uh, above $100 million uh, cash spent on the investment. And as you see, 22 is a rate of about $80, million, 80 to $90 million a year. Our backlog is un, uh, untypically high. And the reason is, will be discussed in the next slide, and our, ca our cash is, uh, actually I can speak about it now, uh, and our cash is 1.05. Now, uh, the reason the backlog is high is, is because in Europe, uh, the results of the conflict in um, Ukraine and the result of the supply chain holdbacks uh, caused our customers didn't cause us problems, but customers that bought machine, machines asked to deliver them either this quarter or even next year. So a lot of revenue from this quarter was held back and postponed, but it is on backlog, which means signed purchase orders. So you will see the results in the next quarter. This is also, by the way, a reason why the gross margins were uh, reduced in this uh, type of product because and it's all, by the way, in very gory details in the news release, because as we sold out of the door less machines, certain overhead in COGS, which was fixed, is, of course, manifesting itself in percentages of revenue as higher number of COGS, lower number of gross margin, because the revenue is lower. But that is going to correct itself uh, between the next quarter already and maybe two, even during the next two quarters. Um, some uh, information about uh, this acquisition I have mentioned before. As you heard from my voice, I'm, we're very excited about it. Uh, the activity and the type of uh, materials are shown here in the picture. Uh, we are expanding already the portfolio and we're expanding the, um, the go-to-market we applied all our go-to-market forces, uh, salespeople around the world, 
They already, since the acquisition in July, had a course and training in these machines, and we're starting to sell them in North America, which was almost not sold, and we're expecting very, very positive uh, results from growth, as I mentioned before. This is just a manifestation of what I mentioned earlier about uh, R&D. There's no way a company can be profitable when it invests 52% of its revenue in R&D. Uh, our business model, which we are running on a five years basis, is showing that profitability uh, on a quarterly basis will happen in 2025. And at that time, the ratio of the R&D to the revenue is going to be down below 20. So, uh, as a, uh, I should correct myself. The R&D is not 50% of revenue. It's 52% of operating expenses, which is much, much less than 52% of revenue. But you have the actual numbers in the left, so that's easy. R&D is $18 million a quarter. Out of this $18 million a quarter, my estimate is the R&D for uh, AME is uh, much more than a half, uh, actually closer to $14 million. So uh, it's obvious why I said before that we are uh, very encouraged with the results in the products in the AME, which are coming to the market in the next two quarters, because that's what's going to lead us to the growth as expected and profitability. Uh, this is just a comparison of our cash divided by our annual run rate. So if you take us and three competitors in the market, by the way, they're not direct competitors, uh, but at least they're in the same market, you can see that we have 14, almost 14 years if we continue to burn cash the way we are, and we're not going to. As you already heard, I, we cut it even this quarter. Uh, but assume we continue at uh, 88 to $90 million a, quarter, a year, we have 14 years without acquisitions. And then the other companies have between less than a year to around two years. So we're very comfortable that we're not going to go back to the market to raise more money. And we are uh, comfortable that it's not going to take 14 years to spend this money, A, because we're spending more of it on acquisitions and wait for the news it's coming this year and earlier. I mean, 2003 and earlier, 2023 and earlier. And uh, it's all aimed for profitability with spare cash as we need. As much as revenue for the uh, three months and nine months, I mentioned before on the right side, uh, you see the, um, on the right side is the, the quarter and on the left side, in, in the right side, it's the gross profit for the year. The gross year profit, and the, and the left side is the revenue. And you can see how uh, on three quarters, nine months, the number is the 31 and a half I have mentioned before, and the gross margin is accordingly around the 11 and change. Um, vision. The vision of the company has not changed, and the strategy is the derivative of the vision. We are aiming to build a network of very smart machines, mostly additive manufacturing and additive electronics, which are going to serve as edge devices on a manufacturing and on a cloud manufacturing network, both of which the network and the machines are going to be run and directed by our deep cube, uh, deep learning technology. And if you want to use an analogy which will describe it the best way, we are seeing the industrial market moving forward to become you manufacture it when you need it, where you need it, uh, if you need it, and the rest is staying as digital inventory on the cloud. And the analogy is, think today about the paper industry and PDF. You do not buy a printer. You buy a word processor application and you buy the PDF from Adobe or whoever and you work your product on your computer and you print it where and when you need it. And if you need it in England at your lawyer's office, you send it to the uh, cloud and it will be printed there. 
The same vision we're seeing for cloud manufacturing, especially if the edge devices are additive manufacturing machines for electronics and for other additive manufacturing. So that is our vision. And as we build, we know we're not going to have all the types of the edge machines, but we have certain technologies that will be mastering the edge machines for certain type of uh, products. And we are focusing on the software and the artificial intelligence that's managing this network and managing the machines as edge devices. And the vision is described here. I'll just read it quickly to you. Uh, we want to transform the leather manufacturing and different manufacturing electronics to a fully digitized sector with environmentally friendly and economically efficient additive manufacturing that fits the definition of Industry 4.0. It's a one production step conversion of the designs to functioning results and devices. Now, you uh, all realize, I'm sure, that the focus of this vision initially is on high mix, low volume. That's where it excels. When you have very, very large amount of designs and the manufacturing per design is not 40 million pieces. Uh, industries that are served by this kind of profile is uh, defense, is uh, avi aviation, avionics, uh, aerospace, advanced medical, advanced uh, automobile, uh, advanced uh, in this industrial, including energy, and of course, um, uh, uh, the whole uh, array of research institutions and the academy. And all our products are aimed including this vision to this specific vertical direction. Now, let me step off the presentation here and mention to you that about a month and something ago, we had an investors conference in New York, which was very, very successful. We were not the only participants. Many, many companies did participate. And we met 35 to 40 institutional investors. And after we finished the presentations one-on-one, -on -one, we did a survey. We wanted to get feedback from our investors. Some of them were our investors. Some of them, by the way, were new investors, of course. So the feedback is not qualifying who is who because it was uh, unnamed, unanimous. But we had out of about 30, 40 response, we had about seven response that were, I would define them as criticism or requests for what is not being supplied. And I wanted to go to this response specifically. I'm not going to go to the positive response, obviously, to self-serving, but it's not as important as it's important to us to fix what investors feel is missing. So I'll just quickly go through that for you. It may cover part of the questions you are having, uh, make it shorter, or it may not. Hopefully it will help. So the first question is, or was it's very hard to understand organic growth story and how shareholders are served by buying companies without near-term incremental upside? So the response to that is, first of all, all the companies we acquired, bar none, one exception, I'm sorry, it grew organically since we acquired them, which is an amazing achievement. So the company grew the th the growth from $10 million to a to rate of, uh, run rate of 42 is combined, frankly, mostly from organic growth because this year we acquired on only a kind of one and a half company, if you wish, because the first, the last company we acquired in July, it's not even appearing on the numbers. So the organic growth is inherent. Uh, many of, most, most of it came because we merged the companies we merge them into our go-to-market, and we leverage our go-to-market to sell more, and therefore the organic growth, growth comes from there. The only exception which I promised to mention is, I spoke before, the situation in Europe for the company that uh, is in additive electronic, and there was, for instance, a reduction of $1.5 million in sales comparing the year before just from Russia and Poland, which was a very ma major number and 75% down on that section because we stopped selling to Russia for obvious reasons and Poland stopped ordering. And uh, 
this is the exception. By the way, at the same time, the same company, we took them to the United States and grew the revenue in the United States by 60-70% uh, just organically. So, it goes to show you. Second question. One issue we have is how to value the company with relatively low revenue, especially with respect to such large cash balance. Well, that's simple, actually. You take the cash balance, that's worth cash. And to be fair, we had the cash balance of one and a half billion dollars about a year and a half ago, a bit more, February 2021. We we have close to 1.2, including investments today. So we only spent $300 million, out of which half of it was acquisitions and half of it was operating costs. And we're very proud and affected we didn't spend it, but we don't intend to continue not to spend it. We just intend to spend it smartly. So what is the value of our company? First of all, it's valued at $1.2 billion. Then you take our business. We have a 50 or $45 million run rate business, which is very high tech, growth business, advanced technologies. So how much does the $45 million business valued? It's up to you. It can be valued. One-time investment, two time, sorry, one-time revenue, two times revenue, five times revenue. If it was ten, if it was a year and a half ago, it would be valued at ten times revenue. Ten times revenue is half a billion dollars. Half a billion dollars plus 1.2 is 1.7. Divided by 280 million shares, you can find out where, why the share should be seven or eight. But I'm not the one to say what the share should be. I'm just the one to say very simple to value our business. Cash plus the value of the business. And today the value of the business is clear because the numbers are much clearer and the growth is there. Uh, by the way, our revenue by over the last two years only went up by 2,000% and more. So uh, another way to give you a, a guideline or a tool to measure what is the worth of the business. Third question was a uh, person that said, I wish to better understand the company's acquisition strategy, especially in light of looking at so many companies. Since we have Mr. Letterman here, and my voice is getting a little coarse, and he is heading with a team of four or five very talented people, the implementation of our strategy of acquisitions. Why won't you speak a few words about it, please? Hi. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, our, our strategy is, is, is generally two pillars to it. One is technology. Uh, the second is commercial. On the first one is technology. It's about hardware, software, and in particular material science uh, companies that can help us leapfrog our R&D uh, pipeline to get us uh, to where we want to be faster. Um, and then secondly, on the commercial side, it's about acquiring uh, let's say commercially successful businesses that are selling products and services to the same end customer verticals. I think that's a very important uh, aspect of, of what we're doing. Uh, to give a, a, a few examples briefly, on the technology side, DeepCube is an exemplary example of a software, specifically AI, that is a key technology. On the commercial side, our acquisition most recently of Admatech and Formatech is an example of that. The, the products, particularly the, the printers that they make and sell, they sell to the same end verticals that our other businesses do. Uh, a, a third example, and one that's particularly interesting, is our acquisition going back uh, almost a year now of SM Tech. Particularly interesting to us because it is a technology acquisition and a commercial acquisition. This is something, whether of, of these three varieties, that we plan to do significantly more, uh, in large part because of the market valuations, which I'm sure uh, have been discussed before and we can elaborate on later. Um, uh, the one thing we don't do with the acquisition strategy is we don't buy companies that has to be maintained afterwards as a silo, standalone subsidiary. We're not in that business because there's no synergies, no growth, and no uh, uh, delivery of uh, dollars to the bottom line. The second thing about uh, acquisitions is the size. As much as I'm concerned, I'm much better by a company with $200 million of revenue than a company with 10 or 20 or 30. We've been looking at it. We've been negotiating that for, uh, I would say, two years. And we said no to everything other than what happens over the last quarter and a half. We're starting to see finally 
the numbers shrinking down. People don't ask for five to ten times revenue anymore. And the large companies that we have looked at, none of them other than one was sold. And uh, our total preference is to buy large companies as long as they fit the guidelines that were described by uh, okay. Julian. Now, another feedback. Large cash balances that are just on balance sheet are not strategic assets, and the company will be pressured to spend it. Very good comment. And let me tell you something. Uh, cash is not strategic question, but cash, cash can buy strategic, which means cash is strategic asset in potential if you spend it right. If you spend it wrong because you're under pressure because questions like this are being asked, then it is not a strategic asset, and then it's going to become a wasted asset. So uh, I'm sorry to, for the person who asked this question, which I don't know, but I'm telling you, I am totally committed not to spend your money unless I think it is converted to a strategic asset, which it is. Everything we spend it until now was, and hopefully the few things that are on our table right now are going to make you even happier because of the size and their strategy. So uh, today, look at our competitors. Companies in this industry are anything between one and a half years of survivability with their cash to less than a year. And that, that makes cash much more strategic in regular times, and it makes it positive for myself as an investor and, and you as investors because reduces the chance of going to the market and needing to raise money at a lower valuation as the market delivers right now. And people who know our industry know without name certain companies that raised over the last half a year emergency cash at the valuation of half and less of their valuation before. And, of course, they, they, that took them down. Next question, an investor asked, why did the company invest in strategies? I don't want to invest in companies and invest in other public companies, particularly in the same sector. I agree with this person 100%. This, it's not attractive for me as an investor or for you to invest in public company or invest in public companies. Uh, this is one of a kind. I explained it a few times before. I don't want to get too much into details, but it is a strategic investors, sorry, strategic investment, which is explained in the email when we announced it. Please read it. It stays very strategic. We are now the largest shareholder of Stratasys as much as we know. Uh, Stratasys came out with the last quarter result. They were the only company in this industry other than us, and they're bigger, of course, that came with good quarter results without excuses. So we're very uh, happy with them, and we're looking at this very favorably as much as what is going to happen in the future. But we're not going to do other investment in public companies. Uh, this, definitely this gentleman is right. Uh, investor feedback about um, following the stock a long time. And sorry, uh, that's not what they want. It's the next one. The market cap and cash value uh, have a disconnect. And this is concerning. The company is either burning cash too fast or there is not a real business to support. Well, the fair question, it stems from a source of lack of knowledge, which is fair, because this is probably a person that met us the first time. So a uh, company is not burning cash too fast. I described to you the cash we're burning in the 14 years we can be living with that. Obviously, it's not going to be the case. And do we have a real business or not? Well, we have a 45 or 45 or 43, 45 million run rate business with gross margins that's growing, and we spoke about it enough. We think it's real, and it's growing. Uh, last but not least, uh, with the reluctance to buy back shares, the company must do solid acquisitions in 2023. Two comments about that. First of all, I agree that we must do solid acquisitions in 2023. Secondly, regarding reluctance to buy back shares, well, watch us. We have a year to do that, and we know to value on a 
the board is valuing on a monthly basis uh, when and how much to to buy, and uh, you will hear about it. Until now, I think I went through the seven comments I wanted to go through, and uh, I think it's time to let you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, ask your questions, and we'll be happy to answer. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. The first question today comes from Ashok Kumar with Think Equity. Please go ahead. Much. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first one is uh, on the supply chain of components. Uh, are you seeing an ease up there which would help support um, you know faster organic growth? And uh, you also talked about uh, cash burn and uh, R&D, right? So. Uh, R&D is about 60% of cash burn, you know, now, and uh, your cash burn is about $80 million annualized uh, on average. Uh, you talked about R&D dropping to about 20% of um, expense ratio by 25 versus, uh, you know, currently it's about 60%. And uh, so um, just in absolute numbers, right, so where do you see that in 25 from the $55 million plus or minus uh, today? And the third part is the gross margin trends, I think, which you also highlighted, uh, 65% on new machines and, you know, mid-30s on the traditional, you know, surface uh, technology uh, with uh, increased focus on software and uh, service, which is not part of your revenue stream now. Uh, where do you see that um, in that same time frame, 25? Thank you very much. Okay. Let me start with the second and the third. I don't remember the first one. But the second one was about the R&D expense. Make, let me make it clear because I think it was a, a bit my mistake in the slide and I kind of maybe have confused you. Our R&D expense today as percentage of operating expense is 51%. Our business model leads to R&D going down as percentage of revenue to less than 20% of revenue. That is where the profit starts to come up at the bottom line, EBITDA and below. Now, in order to reduce the R&D to less than 20% of revenue, there's two ways of doing it. A, increasing revenue. B, reducing the actual dollar spent on R&D. We have a very clear business model moving forward that the only assumptions that are less known there is, of course, what acquisitions will come on the way. And we have certain assumptions about acquisitions as well. And in 2025, it shows that the profit on the EBITDA level comes somewhere in the middle to the third quarter of the year. Uh, and that's exactly when the EBITDA, sorry, the um, R&D level of, in percentage goes below 20% of revenue. And, um, and it goes, frankly, it depends on the, how fast the revenue grow. If the revenue grow fast enough to fit this model, we're going to continue to invest in R&D in order to accelerate product development and new technologies. If, from the other side, the revenue grows a bit slower, then we will reduce the amount we spend on R&D, but we'll choose where to reduce it so we don't risk our innovation, which obviously creates the, the revenue moving forward. So the, the last question that you asked was about our uh, gross margin and services and software moving forward. Uh, we have a lot of investment in software now, which includes you know, or comes from the concept that we believe that as the anal analogy I gave you and when you print documents, you don't think about your printer. You buy the printer from Lexmark or HP or whoever. You think about what kind of software you're using to design the document. It's the same for product. We are focusing on design, and therefore we're focusing on adding uh, software to the mix, which includes software potentially in the future uh, as a service and software as part of selling a machine. And uh, we see this starting to affect the numbers at the end of 2023. Um, and I'm sorry, Ashok, 
Can you remind me the first question? Oh uh, yeah, the first question was just basically uh, supply chain components, right? Whether you're seeing any. Oh yeah. Yes. Ease up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We do not feel a supply chain uh, issue with our machines. What we did is when the, th the whole thing started, since we were not stranded for cash, we pre-purchased a lot of our semiconductors that we need for our own usage in advance. And by the way, we paid premium for that, but we didn't care. By the way, it does affect gross margin, but we didn't have any delay because of delivery mach delivering machine because of that. So we're not affected. What we are affected is that our customers are affected by lack of components. So customer, for instance, who buy additive manufacturing, additive electronics uh, machines, which are used to position and add and mount components on boards, since they don't have the components, they say we bought the machine, but we want it to be delivered next year. But that's the effect on us, not by effect on our manufacturing. Uh, one last question on the M&A strategy. You have been very disciplined uh, in terms of acquisitions. And earlier talked about uh, having both a, a technology and a commercial uh, strategy in that uh, realm. I mean, the, the acquisition of uh, the Polish company was a sub of a large American company. It looks like you're open to, to large acquisitions. And then how that fits into this uh, cloud manufacturing strategy, the machine learning, and deep learning, and so on, right? So I think how you tie all that you know, yeah. together. Very, Thank very, you very, much. very good. Excellent question. First of all, it was not Polish company. It happened to be a Netherlands company, but close enough, a bit north, uh, actually north and uh, west. Um, the component of the, 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 the component of in the decision algorithm of what to buy, which is derived from our uh, ownership and our, our achievements in the deep learning uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence is critical. All the companies we buy, uh, less very small exceptions, will gain from applying the artificial intelligence, the deep learning that we have into the machine, which will increase their uh, throughput, especially through increasing their yield by having a very uh, smart robotic brain that in real time can identify errors in printing and correct them or stop the printing. So it increases the yield. No artificial intelligence deep learning machine exists like this in the world today that can do it in real time with 30 milliseconds response time other than in um, uh, Tesla actually. And probably in, 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 in certain deep learning in, uh, in space technology or in, in missile technology. But other than that, we have it. The difference is they have to do it over in hardware. We have the patents and we did it in software so it can work actually with a regular computer inside the machine. So uh, that's point number one and uh, about acquisitions. And point number two is yes, we are looking at large acquisitions, larger acquisitions and the way they fit the cloud manufacturing uh, concept is that the machines that the, or the companies were acquiring and manufacturing the machines through the integration of the uh, deep learning is going to connect the cloud and enable through the software developing a design through the cloud, including inventory subject to IP protection. Certain defense companies will do it on a private cloud and downloading it straight into the machine, which is a micro center for manufacturing, and it's being printed as needed and when needed. So it fits beautifully, and um, we're actually very, very excited about the, about the concept, this concept. Okay, thank you very much and all the best. Thank you. Next question. The next question comes from Anne Margaret Crow with Edison Group. Please go ahead. Hello, uh, thank you for taking my questions. Um, I have uh, a couple, um, mainly related to acquisitions. So firstly, um, could you talk a little more about how you are actively integrating the acquisitions to re remove that 
silo effect that you talked about. Um, following on from that, um, how, uh, when should investors start to see um, the results of this integration, or are there, is there evidence of that already with regards to cross-selling and um, the integration of the deep cube technology into other you know existing systems that you have already um, and then the third question is looking at the the cash pile that you that you have um, and you, one alternative would be not to spend it on acquisitions and then you'd have you know 14 years of cash at the current rate of cash burn, um, which you know, clearly you're not going to do. Um, could you give us any indication of roughly how much of that cash you've got earmarked for acquisitions? Um, I think you've made it you know, quite clear that valuations are more reasonable now, so you've got much more to choose from. Okay, that's great questions. As usual, you know, the human brain, or at least my brain, is limited. So we remember the last question, and we start with the last question. Okay. And then we go backwards. Uh, uh, the cash that is earmarked for acquisitions uh, in the next uh, three to five years is uh, between six to $800 million. Uh, we have certain assumptions about that. We have some assumptions based on the multiples today of how much can it uh, bring as, as revenue because multiples by now are going much lower than two times revenue even, so it be starts to become very, very interesting. Um, and uh, yes, we're not going to wait 14 years. We are hopefully not going to wait five years because we'll accelerate until now. We are ahead of our plan. When I had this five years model and program, I had it since two years ago, and we are ahead of that plan. So that's point number one. Point number two, the DC technology, we are looking at the acquisitions, as I mentioned before, and the, the deep learning is a very, very advanced technology. It has one, if you want to call it, disadvantage. It needs huge amount of data from the field, which means a machine that will fit our engine of deep learning needs to have a lot of data it manufactures. It can be data through all kinds of sensors. It can be data about temperature, data about uh, vibration, data, of course, visual data, uh, thermal data. So we are measuring, if, if they don't manufacture this data, then it will take longer time to implement uh, the deep cube into the machine. So mm -hmm. we are looking at acquisitions also based on how the machines are built and if they are data rich. Because if they are data rich, the effect of the deep learning as a self-learning technology that able to correct without human interference is much, much more, uh, uh, is maximized, actually. Now, mm -hmm. going back to the question before, you asked about how do we do this integration in order not to keep it in a silo format and what's the result or when will we will see the results for this uh, integration. Oh, I'm impressed. I remember all your questions. So... <laughs> uh, the, the integration is an example. We acquired a year ago, no more than a year ago, actually exactly, exactly. in November, the additive electronics company in Switzerland. Uh, since then, we converted all the North American sales into our go-to-market, and as a result, the sales in North America almost doubled in, in, uh, organically. And we already started the whole infrastructure. We are going to build our next machine in energy manufacturing electronics in Switzerland, not in Israel, because it's, because it's better, frankly. They are better in building machines. They are building machines for 20-something years, similar kind of technologies. So we have started already to build machines in Switzerland, uh, which originally were built in Israel. Third point, uh, we are already applying our artificial intelligence technology to the machines that were built in Switzerland, and 
to develop. In this case, they didn't have, have enough uh, data. So we're developing the sensor array to generate enough data so we can apply the AI. Another example is a company in, uh, that we acquired in the Netherlands only in July. I think I mentioned it before. Since July, we already trained all our salespeople to go to market, which is much bigger than that company had, to sell their company. Now, since it was in July, August, September, October, November, uh, they already have uh, revenue ahead of what they budgeted themselves, but they, what you'll see it is, is next year. I'm not talking about over it, which is, of course, very easy. You know, we have one finance department. We don't have a whole array of finance and administration people in every company we buy, and if we do, we move them around, so become very, very efficient. And uh, our management team, think about the following. We have 12 people in our senior and mid-management team, Five of those, first of all, 10 of those are ex-CEOs. 10 of 12 are ex-CEOs. They joined us, I guess, with the excitement of working with such a, an open-ended and beautiful planned uh, development and growth plan. But out of this, five were from acquisitions, which means mm -hmm. a management team is, of 12 is integrated with five, which are ex-founders or ex-general managers of the acquisitions we did. So that's closing up on your first question. Right. Next question, please. So those were my questions. Um, so um, over to somebody else now, I think. But thank you very much. Thank you very much. So fully. Okay. Okay, guys, it's 50 minutes. I think uh, this is, uh, you know, everybody has a day of work ahead of them. Uh, unless there's uh, other questions, I want to thank you very, very much for participating. Thank you very much for your interest. And again, you have our emails, phone numbers, and you know how excited we are to speak with you. So even if it's offline, looking forward to that. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank the you. Conference is, now con conference is now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation.